tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with the audio adaptations of three rounds of frightening fiction about creepy correspondence, post-mortem protectors, horrifying house guests. I'm Otis Jiry, host of Scary Stories Told in the Dark podcast, now in its sixth season. My show is available on iTunes and wherever podcasts can be found. And tonight I'll be filling in as host on behalf of my good friend Steve Taylor, and I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring our frightening fiction to life are voice actors Adam Der Dingman, Danielle Hewitt, and Luis Bermudez. All of them top performing contestants and fourth round finalists in Chilling Tales for Dark Knight's latest evil idol horror voice acting competition. If you enjoy their performances tonight, visit our YouTube channel Vote on theirs and the other entries in the competition while you still can. The final entry in the fourth round went live recently, and voting on each contestant concludes one week after their posting dates, meaning there's still time to vote and help decide who takes home this year's crown. So check out our channel and join in the deliciously dark fun yet to come. You can find CTFDN and the Evil Idol competition on YouTube. Just search Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube on any search engine or visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Evil Idol link on the navigation bar to see your current roster, contestant profiles, and links to all of the performances thus far. We and the candidates appreciate your support. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights. Turn on the dark. <laughs> our first tale tonight is written by author Richard Saxon and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number nine, Adam Dergeman. In it, a man copes with the loss of his father following his death and discovers just how badly his father wanted to patch up things between them. So badly, in fact, that he won't let death get the final word. Without further ado, I present to you, every year on my birthday, I receive a letter. Today marks the 20th anniversary of my father's death, taken away by a single, senseless act. It just so happens that today is also my birthday. He'd been working late, as he often did, regardless of birthdays or holidays. I understood it was a painful memory for him, and though our relationship had always been a bit strained, I never blamed him for making a living. Because as a single father, he had a lot on his mind, and I respected that. That night, on my 18th birthday, 
My father was hit by a drunk driver on his way home. He never even made it to the hospital. His insides were so utterly torn to pieces by the impact that he simply died before the paramedics could even show up. A few weeks after the funeral, I was trying to piece together the legal mess that comes following someone's death, inheritance and so on. It certainly wasn't anything a teenager should have to deal with, but I was alone, no close family and no one to guide me through the world. Ironically, his lawyer seemed to know more about my father than myself. After dealing with whatever assets left behind, he'd been given a set of instructions, all prepared by my father should he ever meet an untimely demise. I signed all the necessary documents and was given some advice on how to survive the loss of a loved one. Then, I received a letter. It was wrapped in a beautiful silver envelope, only decorated with my name. I opened it, careful not to rip it apart, and started reading. Dear Richard, I'll start this letter by admitting to one undeniable truth. I am not a good man, and I've been an even shittier father. I've made plenty of mistakes, left too many things unsaid. I could make up the excuse that I'm simply a product of my time and the people that raised me, but I'll cut the bullshit and just apologize. Your mother died while giving birth. It's a hard fact to live with, and though I've seemed cold at times, I need you to know that I never blamed you for any of it. How could I? You came to this world as a beautiful little creature, never asking for life, yet appreciating every moment of it. I'm writing this on your birthday. You've just turned 18 and I'm staying behind at work to finish this up. I don't think I'll hand it to you yet. I'm still not done dealing with my own issues. But I promise that as soon as I'm able to man up, I'll tell you all the things I should have as you grew up. That I'm proud of you. That I love you. I wish I could say this to your face, but I'm a coward. Taught myself that emotions are for the weak. So, for now, I'll put this on paper. It'll be waiting among my other things, and my last will and testament, should anything ever happen to me. But that'll hopefully be many years from now, and by then, you won't even need this letter to remind you. You're a better man than me, Rick. I hope you know that. I'm sorry I haven't been a better father. But I'll promise I'll change. I love you. Dad. My father had died the same day he wrote that letter. He probably instructed the secretary to send the letter to his lawyer in the morning. I don't really know how else they would have gotten a hold of it. I read the letter a couple more times before folding it neatly back up. Then I just sat down on the floor and cried. I kept it together for so long. I never shed a tear as the police officer handed me the news and I continued my cold appearance throughout the funeral proceedings. But he was right. We'd never been close and I never thought he loved me. But hearing these simple words, though only from a piece of paper, was far more than I could handle. I dug up some old photo albums from my childhood, sifting through them and realizing he always seemed happy, smiling wide in each photo as I turned the pages. Seeing those memories in a new light truly broke my heart. We'd left so much unsaid, but all the emotions were there, shown through the smiles on our faces and the moments we shared. That's what truly mattered. Not the words that could have been said, but the time spent together. And that would have been it. 
my father had passed and life moved on. I kept the small house for myself, it had already been bought and paid for, and I kept on with my studies. Then, one year later, on my birthday, I received another letter. It was beautiful, silver envelope, just like the last one. Encased in a pattern of vines and bizarre looking symbols just small enough to remain hidden at first glance. In the center, it simply said my name, written crudely, but not without charm. His handwriting was unmistakable. The letter, without a doubt, came from my father, but how had he sent it one year past his demise? I thought about it briefly and figured he must have instructed his lawyer to send a letter on my birthday each year. It sounded unlike something he would have done, but I'd already been surprised the last year, so I just opened it and started reading. Dear Richard, where do I begin? I'm not even sure this letter will reach you considering where I am, but I'm giving it a shot anyway. It's been exactly one year since my death, though I have to admit, time works a bit differently here. It feels like a hundred years have passed since you turned 18. Yet, I know for you, only one year has gone by. I'm not much of a poet, but I'm sure not even Edgar Allan Poe could have found the words to describe the beauty of this place. It's, simply put, unbelievable. You need to know that I never suffered. The car hit me at such speed that it killed me instantly. No pain, nor any memory from the incident. My world just disappeared and a moment later, I woke up surrounded by the most beautiful light. Where here is, I'm not exactly sure. I suppose it's heaven, though I can't say exactly what I did to deserve such a gift. It's like a city, stretching endlessly as far as I can possibly see. Buildings, spires covered in silver that stretch up into the sky, hiding among the clouds above perfectly constructed, and each magnificent in their own way. There are no horizons here. The world only ends when it's too far away to comprehend. Just tiny figures dancing in the distance. But it's beautiful nonetheless, enveloped in colors I never knew existed. It's perfect. You don't feel hunger, thirst, nor tiredness. Yet the food is bountiful and always tastes exquisite. I don't need it, but it's a joy to feast nonetheless. Never feeling too full, never gaining, nor losing weight. There are some things I can't tell you. The guards or angels? I'm not sure what to call them. But they're telling me I have to follow the rules. Upon asking, they simply scoffed and told me to figure it out on my own. They're certainly not the beautiful creatures I expected them to be, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is that I'm looking for your mother, but in an endless city, that's easier said than done. There's really no register here, so no one can actually tell me where to find anyone, though I suppose with eternity ahead of me, I'll just have to keep looking. The population is strangely scattered here, and no one I've spoken to have been here for more than a few years. I suspect there's some kind of hierarchy in place, or maybe that we have to wander further into the city to find our loved ones. It's a lot to take in, and I wish I could tell you more, but now I need to go. In any case, I love you, Rick. I wish I had said that while I was still alive, but at the very least... This is better than nothing. Love, Dad. I wasn't sure how to react. Sure, it was his handwriting, but it had to be some kind of joke. I called up his old lawyer and asked if he'd sent the letter on behalf of my father. He denied it, saying that his job had ended the moment I signed over my father's remaining assets here on Earth. Next, I turned to the few friends I had, 
interrogated them about the letter without revealing its content. They acted innocent, which made me feel guilty. They'd been great as long as I'd known them, always there for me, and without them, I couldn't have survived the passing of my father. So, without any further solutions, I let it go. I put the letter alongside the rest of my father's belongings and forced myself to move on. I almost forgot. I truly did. Then the third letter arrived. Yet again, on my birthday, exactly one year later. Dear Richard, I found her. After an impossibly long search, I finally found her. Your mother, Helen, the love of my life. I knew she had to be here. She'd always been one of the best people I knew. I guess I should explain. As I said in my last letter, time doesn't flow as you would expect, at least not here. Despite that, we keep track of it like we do back on Earth. I suppose it makes it easier to look out for your loved ones. It just feels longer. Your mother, she's not exactly herself. I found her on top of one of the spires. Rick, I've never seen her like this. She looks nothing like the woman I knew and loved before. Yet I know it's her. I can feel it in my heart. She's so skinny emaciated and on the brink of starvation. I didn't even realize that could happen. I myself haven't eaten in weeks, yet I feel completely fine. She just keeps repeating the same sentences over and over. I don't understand. I tried to be good. What did I do wrong? I tried to convince her to leave with me but she doesn't even recognize who I am anymore, and I can't simply force her, believe me, I've tried. Up here, it's just impossible to do anything to anyone against their will. I realized that when I tried to write about what I saw on the first day, but found I couldn't form the words. It's hard to describe, but we have free will here as long as we follow the rules. Anything else is literally impossible. The angels turned their attention to me after I hung around your mother for more than a few days. They told me to leave her alone. I tried to explain, but they wouldn't listen. I had to leave her, Rick. I couldn't stand to see her like that, but I'll keep checking up on her, I promise. Once I tried the few ideas I could think of, I asked some other people here for help, but most of them, like myself, knew and clueless. The few veterans I've found only tell me to let it be, that I'll get myself in trouble if I keep messing around. I have to go. They're looking at me. I love you, Rick. I hope we don't see each other too soon. Just live a good life. It's far too short. His handwriting seemed rushed towards the end. I must have read the letter a dozen times, trying my best to figure out what was going on. Since I had no means of tracking the letter, I couldn't do much other than listen to my gut. As strange as that might sound, I believed every word. I decided I would respond, that I would write to my dad and see what happened. Honestly. I felt kind of stupid as I put the letter down on my doorstep, expecting it to magically vanish during the night. But even the smallest chance at contacting the afterlife was one worth taking. Of course, when I opened the door the following day, it was still there, mushy with smudged ink from a small storm that passed during the night. Defeated, I could do nothing but wait for another year to pass. As my birthday rolled around, I hatched a plan to catch whoever delivered the letters. I camped outside in my garden waiting for the culprit. Hours passed. I waited from the early hours, and as midday arrived, 
I decided to call it quits and head back inside. There it lay, on the other side of the front door, on top of my slippers. A perfect silver envelope with my name written on it. Dear Richard, I found someone willing to answer my questions. They claim they've kept an eye on me for some time, but that I wasn't ready to see them, so they kept me waiting, hoping I'd one day come around. I'm not exactly sure what they meant by ready, but they say that until I see what this place truly is, I won't understand. Unlike my other companions, these people weren't smiling. They didn't seem healthy. They appeared as sickly, twisted human beings that have long since forgotten who they once were. They gave me a heads up, though, that time only passes as fast as we need it to, that a year can feel like a century, or it can pass by in a week, whatever that means. They mentioned something they simply refer to as the dome. They say it's in the center of the city, an almost impossible distance away. They offered to take me there once I'm ready, but I can't. I need to stay. I have to take care of your mother. Of course, the Silver City still stands tall and magnificent, but the food has lost its taste. Drinks just feel unnecessary. I've indulged on occasion, tried to recreate the feelings I had when I first arrived here, but to no avail. My only purpose now is to find a way of reconnecting with your mother. I know I can get through to her. I just need to find a way. While I search for answers, I still visit her from time to time, just to sit by her side as she stares off into the distance. Maybe one day I'll get a glimpse of what occupies her mind, and hopefully she knows that she's not alone. I know she's utterly broken. But as long as I'm able to, I'll protect her. I promise you that. Happy birthday, Rick. I'm happy to have had the opportunity to stay in touch, even if it's impossible for you to respond. I love you. Dad. That's how my life went from there on. Each year on my birthday, my father sent me a silver letter. Just updates from the afterlife. And as bizarre as it all felt, I felt happy to have a connection with my dad. Though it had been partially tainted by the image of my sickly mother standing at the top of a spire. On the 15th anniversary of my father's death, my life had taken a drastic turn for the better. I'd just gotten engaged to the love of my life after five years. This all came on top of a promotion at work. All in all, life seemed to be going my way and my birthday was just around the corner. And as always, I eagerly awaited my silver letter. There it was, lying on my doorstep. Except... Rather than a perfectly smooth envelope with vines and symbols engraved onto the surface, I found a crumpled piece of paper, one covered in erratic handwriting, incomprehensible phrases and drawings. Richard, she's gone. Your mother, Helen. I went back to the spire. I had an idea, but she'd simply vanished, leaving nothing behind, no trace that she ever existed. I knew something was wrong even before getting there. The buildings have always seemed impossibly tall, but this time I just couldn't get up the stairs. They kept going for days, weeks of climbing, and once I finally reached the top, I was alone. I've searched the entire section of the city, climbed each building to the top, asked whatever person was willing to talk to me. I, I don't know what to do. I haven't eaten anything since we last spoke a year ago, nor have I had a drink. I don't sleep. I don't do anything other than search for her. I wanted to send you a letter earlier. I needed to tell you what happened, but I had to wait because of the rules. Those damn rules. A few weeks ago, I approached one of the guards. 
I don't know why I hadn't thought of it before, but if heaven was real, then God had to be somewhere up here. I asked the guard about it, and he laughed at me. He touched me on the shoulder and whispered a few incomprehensible words into my ear. It felt like a veil was lifted off me. I could truly see this place for what it is. A concrete jungle with a sky so dark I don't know how I didn't notice it before. The buildings around me, once what I would consider works of art so perfect, a creation that simply couldn't be built by man, I finally see them for what they are. Old, run-down concrete prisons on the brink of collapse. They should have fallen long ago. Yet, there they stand, defying all logic, a pitiful sight to behold. The people I came here with have long since gone, all of them heading towards the dome. In their place, I'm finding more and more people who've been here for an eternity. Hundreds, thousands of years, and they all seem the same. They're all diseased. Whatever features they once had, whoever they once were, it doesn't matter anymore. They've simply existed for too long. An eternity of time to wash away what once made them human. I think it's time for me to wander through the Silver City. Maybe I just need to reach the dome. Maybe I can find your mother there. Maybe I can finally get some answers. Whatever the cost. I can't go on like this. I'm not sure how long it will be until I send another letter. The road towards the dome is different. But it's something I have to do. I hope you understand. Dad. Five years passed without another silver letter. The first year, I was worried. The second, I felt scared. But as the third and the fourth rolled around, I felt relieved. It was as if a heavy burden had been lifted off my shoulders. I'd never been much of a religious person before my father died, yet I never feared death. But now, knowing that what awaited me on the other side wasn't the perfect haven we'd all been taught about, I felt horrified. As guilty as it still makes me feel, I never wanted to receive another letter from my father. Then we arrive at today, my birthday. It's the 20th anniversary of my father's death. As a habit, the first thing I did in the morning was to check the front door. There, on the ground, lay a silver envelope. I picked it up in uncomfortable anticipation. My heart raced as I held it with trembling hands. Crudely drawn pictures covered the front, symbols I couldn't decipher, and a drawing of a dome-like structure surrounded by bizarre shapes that I assumed to be twisted spires. On the inside, I found another letter. It was filled with meaningless phrases, jumbled words and sentences I, I couldn't understand. It was a mess of erratic handwriting, nonsensical and horrifying. From the several pages filled to the brim with text of varying sizes, all I could make out was the following. They gave us everything we wanted, all the imaginable pleasures of the world and more only to take it away piece by piece until there was nothing left but the memory of better times. A cruel joke played on us by whatever creatures rule this place. I thought this was heaven, but it's not. I'm in hell. We're all in hell. But it's not a punishment. It never was. It's just all there is. Death is the beginning of a nightmare that never ends, and there's no way out, no alternative. I'm 
going to enter the dome now. I don't know what I'll find on the other side, but I feel this is the last letter I will ever send you. Enjoy what life you have left, Richard, because once it's over, you'll be right here by my side. I hope you enjoyed. Every year on my birthday, I received a letter, as written by Richard Saxon, and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number nine, Adam Durgeman. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, written by author Stephanie Sism, and voiced by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 18, Danielle Hewitt. In it, we'll meet yet another individual dealing with the death of a loved one, this time the loss of their brother, her constant protector, in a tragic accident. Will our protagonist make peace with her loss and get the help she needs before her guilt consumes her? Stay tuned and find out. Without further ado, I present to you The Promise. The anniversary of Lane's death wasn't for another three days. But when Cochise came on the radio as I approached that curve, I took it as a sign. Lane's favorite song. I pressed the gas and shifted gears as Chris Cornell began to wail. The needle on the odometer crept up. Forty. Forty-five. Fifty. The yellow posted warning sign screamed at me. But still I accelerated. The night Lane died, the cops estimated that his friend Jimmy had tried taking the curve doing 65. Fucking Jimmy. The weird little stoner kid from down the street. I hated him. Hated his faux hippie parents, who changed the flowers around the roadside crosses with the seasons. Like Jimmy and Lane, and those other kids give a damn if it was Christmas or Easter anymore. But the Hendricks did it anyway. Now the crosses were decorated with bright orange leaves for fall. I saw them appear just as I entered the curve doing 67 miles per hour. The rear of my beat-up Civic began to slip, but I gripped the wheel and held on to it, taking the outside. I kept my gaze focused ahead of the slide, knowing better than to fix on stationary objects. Too late to hit the brakes. Instead, I eased off the gas and turned into the spin at the apex of the turn. My car gave a shimmy and a weird bobble. For one heart-stopping moment, I thought this would be the one that got me. But the Civic held on, even on tires that desperately needed replacing. When I accelerated at the end of the turn and whipped onto the straightaway again, I released the breath that I was holding and pulled to the side of the road. I walked back to the place where the four white crosses waited and stared at the name on the first one. Then, I ripped the leaves from it. Jimi Hendrix. They hadn't even spelled his name right. They hadn't taught him how to spell his name, and they hadn't taught him how to take a curve. I walked behind the crosses, and lay on the ground beside a scarred oak tree, in the same spot that had once soaked up my brother's blood. I stared up at the September sky and said, You left me all alone. The night of the accident, my mother had called to say she'd be working late. Although I was only 14 months older than Lane, my mother had always left me in charge. As soon as I told Lane, he'd start pestering me to go to the movies with Jimmy. I usually let him do what he wanted because Lane could dock the birds from the skies. But my mother's new boyfriend made me uncomfortable. He stood too close, stared too long. I'd cast a nervous glance at the living room. Hey, Lane said. Go to Sherry's till nine. I swear I'll be home by then. I won't leave you alone with him. I had nodded, and he grinned. I hadn't smiled back. He'd made me look at him. I promise Dad, and I promise you, I'll always protect you. I swear on my soul. I'll never leave you, and I'll always have your back. So nine o'clock, okay? 
that was a promise he hadn't been able to keep. When I'd rounded that curve a quarter after nine that night, the EMTs were frantically working to save Lane and one of the other boys. I'd thought maybe they'd known Lane would make it to the hospital, because they let me have a few precious seconds by his side. His green eyes had been dazed, unfocused. I'd clutched his bloody hand and screamed his name. He made a gurgling sound and turned his face toward me. Hold on. Hold on. Don't you leave me. You promised you'd never leave me. He'd squeezed my hand. And then they'd pulled me away. He died before they reached the hospital. If Lane had been driving, would he have made the curve? I thought the handling on the Hendrix Accord and my Civic probably wouldn't have been that much different. And Lane had even more experience than I had on a dirt bike track. Unlike me, he hadn't quit when our father died. But that was just one more what if, towering in a pile of what ifs, that loomed high in the sky and meant nothing at all. I pulled into my childhood driveway a few minutes later and sighed. Visits with my mother, never pleasant, grew excruciating around the anniversary of Lane's death. It hurt to see what this place had become, what my mother had become. Flower beds so meticulously tended when my father was alive were strangled out by weeds, framing a sagging, peeling white house with missing shingles. A rusted swing set still lingered beside the house, unused for over a decade, and the outside of this place wasn't half as desperate as the inside. I put the car in park, stepped out and adjusted the short skirt that was part of my work uniform, before kicking a beer can and scowling at the tall grass. I barged in without knocking and followed the sound of the blaring television to the living room, where my mother's boyfriend, predictably, occupied my father's old recliner. I kicked a pizza box and flinched when a cockroach skittered away from my gleaming black heels. Where's mom? I asked, and Darius turned his bloodshot eyes on me. He leered, his eyes traveling slowly up my body then down again. Is that any way to greet me? Oh, my bad. Hey Darius, you fucking pervert. Where's my mother? He laughed and stood, lurching on his feet. For a moment, I felt the same panic I had at fifteen, but my fingers fumbled in my pocket and closed around the knife I kept there. I forced myself to remain calm. I wasn't a helpless teenager anymore. She's at the cemetery, Darius said, then licked his lips. We've got, a uh, time to have a nice little visit. Come say hi to Daddy. Stay away from me. You got all this time. Why don't you go mow the fucking yard? Seems like the least you could do since my mother pays all your bills. His eyes hardened. Don't talk to me like that, you little whore. Moving faster than I anticipated he could, he lunged at me. My head cracked against the drywall and he seized my chin, forcing me to look up at him. His breath smelled like beer and garlic. I gagged. I hear you put out for everybody that comes through the bar where you work. I'm getting jealous. He pressed his filthy, stinking body against mine and tried to push up my skirt, but the knife was already in my hand. His eyes widened when he heard the click of the switchblade. I was sure Darius had been in enough barroom brawls to know what that sound meant. I pressed it against his crotch. That's not big enough to kill me. And if you ever cut me, you better fucking kill me. It's big enough to get rid of some unsightly bulges. I keep her sharp. He released my chin and held up his hands. I led him back away. Tell your mother, if she ain't back by dark, I'm locking her out. This isn't your house. He shot me a baleful look, then slumped back into the recliner. I gulped a breath of fresh air when I stepped outside. I'd left this place as soon as I'd graduated high school, and if not for the obligation I felt for my mother, I would have never come back at all. The cemetery was visible from the driveway, just over the hillside, but I chose to drive. I could guess what shape my mother was in. I found Mama sprawled on the ground between my father's and Lane's graves, a half-empty bottle of Jack in her hands. Once, Bella had been beautiful, as her name suggested, but those days were long gone. Her face was ravaged by alcohol, drugs, and grief. She looked up with bleary red eyes. 
It's time to go, Mama. I said and reached for her arm. She jerked away. I'm not ready to go yet. It's getting dark, and I need to get to work. Go then. I need to make sure you're home, and that you've had your medicine. You want it, right? Of course she did. Mama liked her medicine almost as much as her alcohol. After a near overdose last month, I had taken her pills and dispensed them to her on a weekly basis. It really needed to be on a daily basis, but I couldn't stand the thought of making this trip every day. I suspected Mama went through a week's supply in a couple days, but was also pretty sure it would take more than that to kill her. Mama allowed me to help her up. She kissed her fingertips and placed them first on my father's tombstone, then on Lane's. It was your fault! I wrapped my arms around my mother's waist, taking on most of the small woman's weight. I'd heard comments like that so many times they barely stung anymore. I figured Lane was better off wherever he was. Because surely, this was hell. I was almost jealous of him. I didn't put much stock into the afterlife, and the thought of just nothingness sounded pretty damn good to me. We didn't talk on the way back to my mother's house. No use telling her about Darius. Mama hadn't cared when I told her about him seven years ago. She wouldn't care now. Another wound that barely stung anymore. I helped her to the front door, gave her the little box labeled with the days of the week, and left. All this crap had taken longer than I anticipated, and I was nearly ten minutes late when I pulled up to Charlie's bar. Half the sign had shorted out, so it simply read Char Bar, which was an apt name for anything that came out of that kitchen. That's what the locals called it. Charlie hated it. So I called it that too. I straightened my skirt, flipped and tousled my hair, then undid an extra couple buttons on my shirt. I was a damn good waitress, but I wasn't naive enough to think that's why I got the best tips. When you leave home at 17, you learn to play the game to survive. Brody looked up from the bar when I walked in and gave me one of his perfect dazzling smiles. He was a college kid making a little extra cash while he finished up the school year. Maybe not as spoiled as most of the ones who came through. He actually worked. But a rich boy just the same. He'd be gone before the ink dried on his diploma. The bar was a weird mix of college kids, locals, and stragglers off of Interstate 24. They segregated themselves in odd little clumps. I edged past a rowdy group of bikers and headed toward the bar. Brody placed a bag of lemons on the bar and said loudly, Thanks for uh, picking these up. Sorry I made you late. No problem, I said, taking his cue. Charlie came around the corner. He looked at me, the bag of lemons, and finally Brody. Tell Jacobs, if he can't get the order right, I'll take my business elsewhere. Brody tapped a salute off his forehead, and Charlie frowned. But he disappeared back into the kitchen without another word. Thanks, I said, and he smiled again. He really was handsome. I liked the way his blue eyes crinkled in the corners when he grinned. But we were so different. I wasn't even sure we'd count as the same species. You've got even tables. I already did their drinks. Two and eight have ordered. Six was still looking at the menu. He was always helping me. Every shift, he stayed late to help me roll silverware and refill the ketchup bottles though that was not part of his duties. I'd never admit it, but sometimes the most fun I'd had all days was when we were cleaning up. He'd put some stupid song on the jukebox and sing to me. Sometimes we'd dance, even though he probably just wanted what every other guy who talked to me wanted. At least he was nice about it. Unlike the biker at table three, who was yelling to get my attention. Hey, Blondie, get that sweet ass over here and take my order, I'm thirsty. Christy, the other waitress on shift that night, stood helplessly by, trying to take his order. But the biker would have none of it. I motioned her forward. Take my six. I'll handle it. Looking relieved, Christy scurried away. I pasted on a smile and sauntered over to the table. I spoke to the one making all the noise. A muscular, dark-haired man with a snake tattoo that started at his neck and ended with rattles down his middle finger. What can I get you? He leaned back in his chair and gave me an appreciative smile, fishing his wallet from his pocket by the chain attached to his belt loop. He withdrew two $100 bills and placed them beneath the salt shaker. 
Two buckets of bud to start. One of these is for the tab. One is for you if you don't let us run dry till that hundred is gone. Understand, sweet thing? Sure thing, honey. I drawled, and his grin widened. As I walked away, I heard him tell his buddies. Tell me that ain't the best ass in Tennessee. I rolled my eyes and made a face at Brody, who stood tense at the bar watching the exchange. Two buckets of Budweiser. Avery, that's not your table. You don't have to serve those guys. I can take care of myself, Brody. He frowned, but turned to fix the buckets without another word. Sweet of him to worry, but unnecessary. Plus, that tip would be great, considering rent was due this week. I might be able to actually eat something that didn't come from the char bar. When I returned to the table, I noticed a cell number scrawled on one of the bills. I resisted the urge to roll my eyes again, and instead, engaged in some banter with them. When I walked away, Rattlesnake slapped my ass. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Brody start to come around the bar, and I hurried to head him off. I said I can take care of myself. Do not go over there. His blue eyes flashed. Avery, you're not a piece of meat. He has no right to touch you. I don't mind. He scowled and threw a dish towel behind the bar. Maybe you should. Yeah, maybe I should. Maybe I should do a lot of things. But these days, it was hard to feel much of anything. Finally, the bikers left and the crowd thinned. After I took table four their check, I stepped outside to smoke. When I heard the back door creak open a moment later, I flicked my ashes and said, If I just fuck you, will you stop following me around like some damn dog? Brody sighed, leaned back against the wall and squinted at me. I clutched the shoulders of the man who labored over me. His snake tattoo looked even more sinister covered in a fine sheen of sweat. That wasn't what I was thinking about. Wasn't even thinking about him. Sex was just a release for me. There were never any feelings attached. Maybe that's why Brody's words troubled me so much. I closed my eyes and remembered what he'd said. Jeez, Avery. Why are you such a hard ass? Maybe I just care about you. <laughs> you don't know anything about me. I want to. One chance. Let me take you out on a date. A date? I nearly snorted again. I hadn't been on a real date since high school. One night stands with strangers hardly counted. Brody had no idea. Why would you want to date me? He gave me that crooked grin and shrugged. I don't know, because sometimes you forget to be an asshole? I laughed in spite of myself. I think you're afraid of me. I think you know I'd be good to you. And you don't know how to handle that. I'm not relationship material. I took another drag of my cigarette. You could be. With me. I stubbed my cigarette out and gave him a patient smile. You think we're alike. We're not. I pointed through the window at a group of roughnecks. I'm like them. White trash. Going nowhere. Then I pointed to a group of giggling college girls waiting around the bar for Brody's return. And you're one of them. You'll leave here after you graduate. Marry a girl like that named Mallory or Ashley or Tiffany. And forget about this little dive bar you were working in during college. You'll forget about me. I don't mean anything to anyone. You're wrong. You mean something to me. The biker collapsed on top of me, and I sighed. Glad he was finally finished. I'd hope he could take my mind off things. But now I regretted even coming to this motel room. He rolled onto his back, and I lay there thinking, waiting until I thought he'd dozed off. Then I eased away from him and fumbled with my clothes in the dark. His hand shot out and grabbed me, pulling me back. Where you think you're going? I need to get home. I tried to pull away. Oh no, we ain't finished yet, darling. Just taking a breather. I'm finished, let me up. In the dark, I didn't see the fist swinging around at me. He clocked me in the side of the face and I fell back, stunned. His hands closed around my throat and I kicked and flailed at him, but he was so strong. My last thought before I lost consciousness wasn't of Lane but of Brody, of how disappointed he'd be when they found my naked, battered body in some cheap motel room tomorrow. I tried to tell him. I was no good. Guess he'd finally see that. I woke up on my stomach. 
my cheek pressed against stiff white sheets. It took me a moment to remember where I was. I was smart enough not to move until I got my bearings. I hurt. I hurt all over. Especially my throat. What had he done to me? I needed to cough. My throat burned. Tickled. My eyes watered, and I didn't know how long I'd be able to suppress it. I heard his labored breathing beside me. Sounded like he was out. But I didn't dare turn my head. Instead, I strained to see the dim room, looking for a weapon. He'd left the bathroom light on. I saw the contents of my purse thrown on the worn carpet. My wallet gaped open. Empty. Motherfucker! I gritted my teeth and made a push toward the edge of the bed. I paused, but detected no change in his breathing. I forced myself up on shaky legs and fumbled on my clothes. Stuffing my things back into my purse, I realized my money wasn't the only thing missing. So was my knife. The smart thing would have been to slip out the door and run. But I needed my money. Not just the hundred dollar tip, but the other hundred and seventy he'd taken from my wallet. I crept to his side of the bed and unplugged the lamp. When I tried to lift it, I found it was bolted to the table. So I unplugged the phone instead. Then I searched until I found his wallet. I thought about just taking part of the money. But I thought, fuck it, and took it all. My money, plus two hundred or so. He began to stir. I gripped the phone and crashed it down on his head. He cursed and I hit him again. Then I ran. The morning sunlight nearly blinded me, and for one terrifying moment, I couldn't find my keys. Please, please, please. I gasped, fumbling in my purse. There they were. I jumped in my car, still watching the motel door, but it never opened. I didn't kill him, I thought. Surely I didn't kill him. I was nearly a mile away when I caught my reflection in the rearview mirror. Blood splattered on my face, I hadn't even felt it. Oh god, I said, and fumbled into my glove compartment for napkins. Twenty minutes later, I stood in front of my bathroom mirror, trying to figure out what to do. Ugly red bruises stood out against the pale skin of my throat. Even the whites of my eyes were red. Maybe I should go to the police. It was self-defense, right? I decided to drive back to the motel. To my relief, his bike was gone when I got there. For two days, I never left my apartment. The next night, however, I had to work. I almost called in. This was the anniversary of Lane's death. I might not make it until tomorrow anyway. But with my luck, I'd probably survive. Again. I tried to cover up the bruises with makeup, but that somehow made them look worse. I washed it off, then tied a scarf around my neck. It looked dumb, but I couldn't think of anything else. At least my red eyes had cleared up. Brody gave me a long look when I walked into the bar. Change of shift was busy, and I managed to avoid him until my first smoke break. He followed me outside. That biker guy's been looking for you. Oh? I said, and he frowned at the rasp in my voice. I told him you'd quit. When he came back the next night, I told him you'd still quit. Charlie backed me up. He looked pretty rough. Not as rough as you, though. Before I knew it, he pushed me against the wall and reached for the scarf. What are you doing? I asked, trying to force his hands away. I haven't seen anyone wear an ascot since Fred on Scooby-Doo. The scarf came free in his hands. Jesus, Avery! I felt absurdly near tears at the horror in his eyes. When I didn't speak, he said, That guy said you took his money. What are you into, Avery? Is it drugs? He looked away. Prostitution? A tear slid down my cheek. Is that what you think of me? I shook my head and pushed past him. He tried to grab my arm, but I jerked away, and I walked through the back door, through the restaurant, and out the front. I heard Brody call my name, but I never slowed down. Maybe fate would be kind tonight. I wanted to die. More than anything. I kept picturing the look on Brody's face. He was the only one who'd believed in me. The closest thing I had to a friend. Now he thought I was some sort of crack whore. By the time I hit the curve, I was doing 70. When the rear end came around, I started to spin. I closed my eyes and pictured Lane's face. Suddenly, his voice filled my head, shouting instructions, 
as clear as if he were in the seat beside me. When I opened my eyes again, my car was sitting neatly on the side of the road, just past the white crosses. I opened my door and nearly fell onto the shoulder. I half stumbled, half crawled over to the memorial and collapsed in front of Lane's cross, sobbing. Avery! Avery, are you okay? I rolled onto my back and tried to scramble away. Brody fell to his knees beside me and reached for me. Hey, it's me. I slapped his hands. What are you doing here? Why are you following me? What just happened? He looked at the crosses. His gaze lingered on Lane's. What is this place? My brother died here. I never talked about my personal life, ever. But once I started talking, I couldn't stop. I told Brody everything. About Lane, about Darius, my mother, even about Rattlesnake Guy. When I finally stopped, I was afraid to look at him. Now he would know. I was trash. Just like I tried to tell him. He wrapped his arms around me. I froze for a moment, then sagged against him. His arms tightened around me. What happened to Lane was not your fault. Why would you think that? I was the oldest. I was in charge. We were supposed to stay home. You were kids, Avery. This wasn't anyone's fault. What I just saw, with the curve. You do that every year? I didn't answer. He kissed the top of my head. You're the strongest person I've ever known. I gave a strangled laugh. <laughs> I'm weak. When I went into that curve tonight, I wanted to die. I'm so alone, Brody. He gave me a fierce hug. You are not alone. Not anymore. Let's get out of here, okay? We're going back to my place. I wasn't sure what showed on my face, but he shook his head. Not for that. I'm not letting you stay alone tonight. He stood and reached to help me up. I took his hand. He smiled and hauled me to my feet. I brushed a kiss on my fingertips and pressed it to Lane's cross. Then slid under the arm Brody offered. His place wasn't much bigger than mine, though his furniture was better. I'd muddied my clothes, so he found me one of his shirts and a pair of drawstring shorts to put on. We talked for hours about my family, about his. I learned that money didn't necessarily buy a happy childhood. Even when there was nothing left to say, I felt comfortable. Safe. I hadn't felt that in years. I fell asleep with my head on his shoulder. I woke up some time later, lying on the couch. Brody lay beside me, spooning my back, his arms around me. When I stirred, he mumbled, Don't go. Lying there, wrapped in the heat of his body, breathing in his scent, I didn't want to go. I twisted around and kissed him. He kissed me back, rolling on top of me. But when I reached to tug his shirt over his head, he stopped me. Avery? Please. I want this. He led me to his bedroom. That night, I broke one of my rules. I didn't leave. I woke the next morning and reached for him. His side of the bed was empty. I snagged a t-shirt off the floor and went to search for him. I found him in front of the stove, singing and dancing in his boxers, making breakfast. I pressed my fingertips to my lips, but failed to suppress my smile. Apparently, he didn't hear my approach. I witnessed a rather inspired performance of Prince's song, Kiss. I laughed, feeling happy for the first time in a long time. He whirled, but didn't seem embarrassed. He placed a plate of pancakes on the table and seized me, dancing me around his tiny kitchen. Good morning, beautiful. Good morning. I glanced at the plates of food covering the kitchen table and raised an eyebrow. You having company over? Ha ha. Sunlight streaming through his kitchen window made his eyes look blue and bright as the June sky. Baby, I am hungry. He winked at me and said, And maybe I wanted to impress you a little. I grinned and draped my arms around his neck. Oh, I'm impressed. Mostly that you have this much food in your house, considering we both work at the same place. Well, maybe we used to. I guess maybe we're fired? I took care of it. I talked to Charlie, told him you had an emergency and it's all good. We have tonight off, too. What? Charlie hates me. No, he doesn't. You never miss work. Besides, how would he replace both of us? 
You're amazing. He smiled. So, since we have tonight off, how about that date? Mm, date? You know, dinner, dancing, something besides burned corn dogs and dancing around the jukebox at Charbar. But that's my favorite. I know. I may have set the bar too high, but I'll do my best to impress you. You already impressed me. And he did. Brody was a nice guy. A good man. When I found out I was pregnant six weeks later, he didn't say, Are you going to keep it? Or is it mine? Brody, I don't know if it's yours. I won't put this on you if it's not yours. I don't care if it is. It will be. We will never know any differently. And the baby won't either. I love you, Avery. We can be the parents we always needed. Marry me. He said, Marry me. But I couldn't. Not without knowing. I talked to my doctor, and he scheduled an amniocentesis when I was far enough along. The day we met the doctor to discuss the results, I was a wreck. I'd given up cigarettes the day I learned I was pregnant, and my nerves were shot. I'd been unable to sleep that night, and while staring into Brody's face in the moonlight, I'd made a decision. If the baby was his, I'd marry him, and I'd do my damnedest to be a good wife and mother. If it wasn't, I'd leave in the middle of the night and never look back. I was not going to tie him to another man's child. Brody tried to make small talk while we waited, but I couldn't hold up my end. Both me and my baby had so much to lose. I wanted Brody to be the father so badly. Not for his money, or even his support. One day, this child would want to know about their father. I did not want to have to tell them that I didn't even know his name. Congratulations, Dad. The doctor looked at Brody and held out his hand. Brody's grin lit up that office. He pumped the doctor's hand and then turned to hug me. So I agreed to marry him. On our wedding day, Brody punched his best friend in the face for telling him he couldn't turn a whore into a housewife. Maybe he was right. I didn't know. All I knew was that I would do my best not to let him down. Not to let either of them down. I didn't know if I was capable of love, but that day I looked into Brody's shining eyes over that surgical mask when he held our son for the first time. I knew I loved them both. I couldn't say it, however, but I hoped he knew. He stood by my side when I cut ties with my mother. My son was my priority now. I could no longer try to help someone who wasn't interested in helping herself. I also would never have my child around Darius. Lucas was a difficult baby. Brody and I learned how to live on little sleep. A colicky infant stage progressed into night terrors by age three. That was the age he began to talk a lot more. And also when I started to suspect there was something terribly wrong with my son. One night, as he played with one of his toy cars, he looked at Brody and said, His name is Dale. Brody glanced at the black car with the number three on the door and looked at Lucas in surprise. Yeah, that's Dale Earnhardt's car. How'd you know that? Lucas shrugged and said, My other dad told me. Brody stared at me. Other dad? I shrugged, but I saw the tension in his face. Who's your other dad, Lucas? Lucas wouldn't answer. Can I see you in the kitchen? You can't turn a whore into a housewife, right? I said when we were out of Lucas's earshot. He reached for me and I jerked away. I've never cheated on you. I've never even considered it. I care about you. I know you do. I'm sorry. It just caught me off guard, I guess. He pulled me to him, and this time I didn't fight it. I love you, Avery. And I know you love me, too. I only wish you could say it. I did, too. There was this feeling that, if I did, something horrible would happen. One night, while Brody lay across my lap, I traced the words on his back with my fingertips. I thought he was sleeping, but he kissed my thigh and said, I love you, too. My mother called me a week before the 10th anniversary of Lane's death, begging to see Lucas. She told me she'd been clean two years, and that she'd kicked Darius out the same day I'd told her goodbye. I told her I'd think about it and disconnected the call. That night, I pulled down an old photo album from the closet. I'd stolen it from my mother's house before I moved out. Lucas climbed into my lap and Brody looked over my shoulder while flipping through it. Lucas pointed at a picture of 10-year-old Lane and said, That's me. No, honey. That's your Uncle Lane. He's in heaven now. Lucas ignored me. 
poring over the pictures with an intensity rarely seen in the rambunctious toddler. He pointed at another picture. That's my old dad. That's my dad. He looked at me with his bright blue eyes and said, I know, Mummy. That week, Brody called me from a restaurant parking lot. I heard Lucas in the background having a meltdown. They'd been fishing and stopped to get lunch. Hey, honey. Do you want us to bring you something? I'm good. Why is he crying? You'll never believe it. He's crying because the waitress took away his corn cob. His what? A corn cob. He started screaming that he wanted to make him a pizza pie or something. Like his old dad did. Lucas screamed in the background. Peace pie! Peace pie! Do you have any idea what he's talking about, babe? No. None. But something was there. Some memory tugged at the back of my mind. Okay. Well, we'll be home in about an hour. I love you. He hung up instead of waiting on the reply he knew wasn't coming. I stared at my phone, then impulsively called my mother. Mom, I have a weird question. About Lane. Okay. Did Dad ever make something for him out of corn cobs? Yeah, he made these pipes out of dried out corn cobs and sticks. Lane thought he was big stuff. Clamping it between his teeth and walking around like Popeye. I don't remember that. Well, you were a girl. Your father didn't believe in little girls even pretending to smoke. Did he call them something? He called them peace pipes. He'd grab his cigarettes, hand Lane his pipe and say, Come on, son. Let's go smoke our peace pipes. Why do you ask? This was not something I wanted to run by my mother. An old memory, I guess. They made small talk. My mother told me about the latest sobriety coin she earned and said, Avery, I'm sorry for everything. I'm sorry I didn't believe you about Darius. I... Mom, I have to go. I'll call you later. Some things I wasn't ready to forgive or even talk about. Rummaging through the freezer, I took an ear of corn from a freezer bag and boiled it. Then I shaved the corn from it with a knife and placed the cob on the back porch to dry. I made a pipe and sat it on the entertainment center. Lucas didn't notice it until that afternoon. After supper. He yelled, Peace pie! Peace pie! Until Brody followed his gaze and got it down. He shot me a questioning look and then handed it to Lucas. Lucas stuck the end of it in his mouth and beamed at us. That night, after I put him to bed, Brody and I discussed it. What are you saying? I know it's odd, but you don't really think. I don't know. But he says such strange things sometimes. Even Brody had no explanation for what happened later that week. We were talking, laughing, on the way to the zoo. I was driving. In the back seat, Lucas said, Mama! Brody was in the middle of a story he was telling, so I glanced in the rearview mirror at Lucas but didn't reply. Mama! Damn it, Timmy! I said stop! I slammed on the brakes and was nearly rear-ended by the car behind us. It swerved around us. Brody and I just looked at each other, then Lucas. The blare of a horn jerked my attention back to the front. I looked up just in time to see the car that passed us sail through a green light and get T-boned by a semi. Metal screamed. The semi carried the little red car through the stoplight and crashed into a pickup on the other side. Call 911. Brody shouted and bailed out of the car. Shaking, I did as instructed. When I disconnected the call, I twisted to look at Lucas and said, what did you call me? He looked out the window. Lucas, answer me. Why did you call me Timmy? That's your name. Nearly an hour passed before we could leave the scene. Brody climbed back into the car, shaken. I asked him about the people in the car, and he shook his head. Lucas lay slumped in his car seat, asleep. What just happened, Avery? Do you realize if you hadn't stopped, if Lucas hadn't screamed? That would have been us. That light was green. I burst into tears, and he grabbed me. I buried my face against his neck and sobbed. I waited until we were home, until Lucas was watching cartoons in another room, to pour myself a drink and sit at the kitchen table with Brody. Did you hear what he called me? Brody gave a puzzled laugh. Um, <laughs> uh, Timmy? Jimmy? To be honest, I was more concerned about the other word he said. 
I asked him why he called me Timmy, and he said that was my name. Brody, no one's called me that since my dad died. He reached for my glass and took a long swallow. Your dad called you Timmy? Tears stung my eyes. I was that kid, you know. The kid who was always getting into trouble, always getting hurt, or stuck or something. Lane would always run for help. My dad would look at my mom, sigh, and say, Look, honey, here comes Lassie. Guess Timmy's fallen in the well again. How would Lucas know that? Brody looked at me for a long moment, then at his look-alike son playing in the living room. He shook his head. I don't know. Maybe he said something else. Maybe we misunderstood. He said Timmy. I know he said Timmy. But even if he didn't, why was he screaming at me to stop? He couldn't have seen that truck. Did you ask him? I did, but he wouldn't answer me. Brody called our son into the kitchen. Lucas, why did you call your mom that name in the car? The boy dropped his head. It's her name. Who said that was her real name? My old dad. I felt Brody's eyes on me, but I was watching Lucas. Why did you yell at me to stop? Lucas looked at his shoes. Because I'm supposed to protect you. I closed my eyes. In my head, I heard Lane say, I'll always protect you. I began to cry. Mommy, don't. Lucas pleaded, tugging at my sleeve. I found I was afraid to look at him. Why don't you go play, bud? I opened my eyes and stared at my husband. He looked as scared and confused as I felt. After that day, Lucas didn't speak of his old dad, and after a couple of months, I almost forgot. He was just Lucas again. A handsome little boy with eyes as blue as June sky and a cowlick in the crown of his head, like his father. That fall, I decided I wanted to visit my mother and put flowers on Lane's grave. Brody wanted to go with me, but I told him this was something I needed to do alone, at least the first time. Lucas was asleep when we passed the curve going in. Yellow leaves decorated the white crosses. This time I didn't mind. When I pulled up at my childhood home, I was surprised to see the yard neatly kept and the flower beds exploding with color. My mother sat in a chair on the front porch. She walked out to greet us and stood by the car while I roused my sleeping son. Oh my, my mother said, placing a trembling hand to his cheek. Avery, he's beautiful. Lucas blinked at the older woman, his small face creased in a frown. You look different. Different from what? My mother asked with a laugh. Did you show him pictures? I looked at Lucas and thought of Lane, of how different he'd think our mother looked. The past eleven years had not been kind. Come in. I made lunch. Mommy. No. The bad man. My blood ran cold, but I patted my son's back. The bad man is gone. The rest of the visit passed uneventfully, though Lucas was unusually quiet and clung to my side, at least until we walked to the cemetery. He ran ahead of us chasing a butterfly, but he stopped and ran his fingers over the etching of one tombstone. I realized it belonged to Jimi Hendrix. He paused and gave it a thoughtful look, and then ran ahead. He stopped at Lane's grave. My mother shot me a surprised look, but I ignored her. Lucas played around the tombstones for a while, but he grew increasingly agitated and whiny. Mom, I need to go, I said finally. On the way out, Lucas began to cry as we approached the curve. Timmy, stop. Without hesitation, I pulled over. I unbuckled my seatbelt, then extracted Lucas from the car seat. Hand in hand, we walked over to the row of crosses. Lucas sat on the ground in the spot where I had watched my brother take his last breath. My son looked up at me tearfully. I'm sorry, Mommy. I fell asleep and I couldn't find you when I woke up. I got lost. It's okay, I whispered, feeling the tears slip down my cheeks. It's not. I promise to protect you. I folded the small boy in my arms. You did more than that. You saved me. You forgive me? Of course, I said, squeezing him tight. You saved me. And he wasn't the only one. Brody worked late last night. Lucas had been in bed for hours when I saw his headlights turn into the drive. I ran out to meet him. Is everything okay? I love you. He stared at me for a long moment, then gave me one of those dazzling smiles. Say it again. I did. Then I kissed him. 
Lucas's night terrors stopped after that night, and he never mentioned his old life again. I hope Lane had somehow found peace. Cause at last, I had. I hope you enjoyed The Promise, as written by Stephanie Sism and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 18, Danielle Hewitt. Up next, we've got one final round of fearsome fiction for you, both written and voiced by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 7, Luis Bermudez. In it, an unexpected guest comes calling in the dark of the night for a man tortured by the fallout left in the wake of his life's choices, and gives him a choice from which there is no escape. Without further ado, I present to you The Visitor. Duérmete, niño. Duérmete ya. Que viene el coco y te comiera. When Arthur was a little boy, his abuelita would tell him stories to keep him good and Catholic. Brush your teeth, eat your vegetables, don't hold that girl's hand, else a creature with sharp teeth and long claws would come and get you at night when mom and pop were asleep in bed. For him, growing up in the deserts of Arizona, it was called El Coco. All his friends had different names for them. The Cucuy, the Boogeyman, Baba Yaga, Krampus, and of course, old hat Lucifer himself. But he remembers meeting one kid, quiet a lot of the time, a transfer. He called it something else. He called it the visitor. He remembers hearing him say it, the way it made the air in the room stale and stiff, like walking through molasses, the way it rolled out of his mouth and hit the floor in that empty gymnasium. The look on the faces of the other kids. How they all felt the gravity that the name held. He almost forgot how tired that boy's eyes looked. Arthur lived the quiet life of a middle management banker in the city. He went to work. He came home. He never saw anyone on the way back, not without an appointment and a 24-hour reminder. Private. But Arthur, introverted as ever was a man of some social significance. A year ago, he met a woman who resembled everything his mother ever warned him about. This, in effect, was a form of endorsement. What Arthur could never have expected was that the woman he was fraternizing with regularly and rather carelessly was married to the city's mayor. This quickly became something of a massive scandal, costing the mayor incumbent the election. Six weeks after Mayor Osmond gave his resignation, his family was seen leaving town. It was the last time that anyone would see the Osmond family. Their car was found several miles out of city limits. Linda found dead in the passenger seat, her throat slit. The children and Mayor Osmond, nowhere to be found. A suspected murder-suicide. It was, presumably, brought on by the social humiliation and the infidelity. Four months later, and Arthur still got emails from the online gossip colonists asking for a new statement about the murder-suicide. Arthur never responded. Of course he didn't. Why should he? It's not like Arthur was the one who pulled the trigger. He never knew that she was married, least of all to a major public figure. And as soon as the scandal came to light, as soon as he was made aware of what he was unknowingly participating in, Arthur called the whole engagement off, before throwing his phone into the river. Arthur severed ties with everyone. Anyone who knew Linda, knew her husband, his friends and colleagues from university. He couldn't live with the pity they had for him, the morbid curiosity they always shared, the strange questions they would never want asked of them, but were frequently employed as icebreakers. Hey, you're Arthur, right? Aren't you the guy who fucked a marriage to death? He was paraphrasing, he would admit, but the formula was there. It was now, 
in his bed at 6 a.m. that he was recalling the events of the prior year, recalling the countless mistakes, the immeasurable heartbreaks, and the constant disappointments that people provided him. It was no surprise that Arthur lived a completely private life. So why then, Arthur wondered to himself, could he hear someone breathing outside of his bedroom door? Arthur didn't move a muscle, didn't even dare to make a sound, but instead tilted his head up ever so slightly to see that he was alone in his bedroom. The red display of his alarm clock, illuminating the objects in his room with an evil tinge, casting shadows of horrible creatures with spindly fingers and wiry hair. He must have imagined it, must have been half asleep and still dreaming when he heard it. It couldn't have been breathing. But there it was again, just as strong and distinct as the first, long, ragged breaths as if the lungs in this person's body were filled with something thick. Every cell in Arthur's body was electric, every nerve in his body on high alert, the hair on his arms, legs, and the nape of his neck standing on edge as if he had just been struck by a bolt of lightning. He couldn't help but think to himself that this must be what Deer felt like, staring into the headlights of an oncoming vehicle, powerless in the face of something you have no comprehension of. Like looking into the eyes of God and finding that his expression is one of hatred and not love. The breathing suddenly stopped all at once, and for several painful minutes, the only sound that Arthur could hear was the dripping of his bathroom sink. Then... A massive roar that rocked the very foundation of Arthur's home. He could feel his bed rocking back and forth, vibrating from the force of the sound, a sensation he had only felt once during an earthquake. He stifled out a short yelp, covering it with his hands as the sound escaped his lips. A primal sound, one made by an animal informing the members of its pack that a more dangerous predator is near. A reaction baked into our DNA by our ancestors who slept in caves, which were frequented by hungry wild animals. It was at this moment that suddenly Arthur understood the stories his grandmother had told him about things that came bumping in the night to take away naughty children. There was the sound of something yelping out in pain, a break of something that sounded like bone, and the sound of something heavy and wet slamming against the floor. Still, the door remained untouched and undisturbed. Arthur began to wonder once again if he must be experiencing auditory hallucinations, imagining that something was behind his door but too terrified to open it and check. After several more moments of silence and the sound of sloughing wet material striking his hardwood floors left his memory, Arthur began to feel more confident that he had come completely to consciousness. He slowly stood up out of bed, still feeling the need to be cautious. Placing his feet slowly on the ground, half expecting rotting hands to shoot out from under his bed and grip his ankles, Arthur slowly came to stand at his bedside. He turned slowly to face the door, waited several moments for something to happen, for something to break his confidence. But no breathing, no growling, no bones breaking, only silence. Not a single sound. He took a step, heard the creak of the wood underneath his feet slightly, and waited several more moments. Again, he was greeted with complete quiet. He took another step, and then another, feeling his confidence begin to swell. He got within a few steps of the door before a thought suddenly occurred to him. Something felt wrong. He couldn't quite peg down what it was, but it reminded him of when he would forget his wallet on the nightstand. There was some small detail he was missing, and as he took another step towards the door, he realized what it was. His sink. Why wasn't it dripping anymore? Suddenly, the pipes in the walls began to creak and strain. He could hear the steel swelling just underneath the thin plaster walls. It made the walls in his bedroom look 
as if they were breathing, swelling up and down like ineffective lungs. Then there was the sound of a crack, a crash, and the rushing of water. Arthur began to slowly step away from the door, making his way back to the safety of his bed. The sound of rushing water increased in strength, and pretty soon, Arthur was able to see what appeared to be a muddy, red substance, the consistency of warm syrup, creeping in through the crack under his door. He stared at it, with abject terror as it continued to stream in, stretching out first a few inches from the door, then several feet, making the puddle a small pool. What do you fucking want? Arthur called out to whatever had come to his home in the dead of the night, unsure of what he would do if he received an answer. But as the desperate plea left his lips, the sound of the rushing water subsided. The pool quickly making its way towards his bed ceased all movement. It was odd to him. That liquid, if that's what this was, could just stop flowing suddenly. The moment of silence was quickly filled with the voice of someone he did not know coming from beyond the door. Will you let me in? Arthur did not answer. Couldn't, in fact, as the air had left his body. Whatever this thing was, it spoke to him, clearly and in English. But it sounded like a man, his voice like rocks tumbling down a mountain. What if I don't want to let you in? He asked nervously. You will, when you realize the alternative. The voice was certain, matter of fact even. He tried to process the information, considered his options, and formulated a response. For now, he needed more data. He needed to have some idea of what he was dealing with. What are you? It was the next logical question. Can't you guess? You called me here, didn't you? Was that true? Had Arthur truly called this creature here just by remembering a story from his childhood? El Coco, the Kukui, the Boogeyman, the Visitor. He remembered the dead look in that little boy's eyes. Remembered that three weeks before, his parents had died in a horrible accident. Just before he was being transferred to a new school. Eleven years old. No friends. No family. Suddenly in an entirely new state and school. And the thing he was most terrified of? The visitor. What do you want? I want to come in. Then why can't you? Because you have to let me in. That's how this works. The visitor's voice took on an amused quality to it, as if he was aware of some joke that Arthur wasn't, or as if he were playing to an audience. Believe it or not, Arthur, you called me here. You brought me to this place. And once called, I cannot be sent back. I must be invited in, or you must forfeit that which holds the most value. What does that mean? What am I forfeiting if I don't let you in? Arthur pleaded. He hated not knowing the rules to whatever game this thing was playing. But for whatever reason, he was safe in here. This thing couldn't get in on its own, even if it wanted to. But he had to know what would happen if he didn't play by the visitor's games. What's to stop me from leaving my room or just waiting until morning? Morning will not come. And if you would like to leave, that is perfectly allowed. Only choose whether you would like to use the front door or the window. Personally, I'm partial to the door. The door started to rattle, and with it, the floating shelves along his walls adorned with his school awards and collectibles. The figures, still bound in their packaging, came tumbling to the ground, some splintering open, breaking the toy inside into several pieces, scattering them across the room. He watched a framed picture of his grandmother fall to the ground, 
the glass shattering on impact, the wood frame breaking into two pieces. Arthur let out a tormented scream, unable to maintain his composure. He had never felt terror like this. It felt like his heart, beating as fast as it was, would stop beating at any moment. His chest felt like it was being gripped in a vice, and he could swear that he was on the edge of passing out. He was brought back to reality by the sound of laughing. He watched as the pool of maroon liquid suddenly began to retreat backwards under the door, as if there was some kind of sponge or vacuum system sucking the substance back up. And there, on the floor in front of his bed, a cell phone. His cell phone. What the fuck? I told you. You called me here. Arthur couldn't breathe. Couldn't focus on anything but the pounding of his heart in his chest. It felt like it was fighting to get out, to abandon him to whatever fate was awaiting him. Pick it up. The voice, like rolling thunder, said. Arthur hesitated looking back down at the floor and the darkness beneath his bed. Now he truly did believe that something may reach out and grab him, but the alternative was angering the visitor. So, he gingerly placed his bare foot on the ground, and after several agonizing seconds of waiting, felt secure enough in his lack of bed monsters to place the other foot down. Walking over, he knelt beside his cell phone. The screen was cracked in one spot, but otherwise, it looked mostly untouched. Surprising, he thought, considering he had chucked it into the river. He could still remember that day. The news had just broken about their affair, and Linda had all but pretended that he didn't exist. And standing there in the freezing cold winter, the rushing water beneath the bridge out of town sending a frigid mist into his face, he couldn't help but feel betrayed. Linda had always told him that they would leave together one day, that they would get married as soon as she got away from her husband, as soon as she got custody of the kids, as soon as the time was right. The time, it appeared, would never be right. They had played with the idea once, getting married. They mused about it one night, laying under the sheets, Arthur tracing patterns on her shoulders. <laughs> what do you think you would wear? Linda chuckled. I don't think I've ever seen you in a suit. Can you even tie a proper Windsor knot? <laughs> I'll have you know that my grandmother did in fact teach me how to tie a tie. Uh, is that right? It sounds weird, like there should be another verb for tying a tie. Just sounds silly. Linda laughed gently, before pushing her head into his chest. Her hair smelled like honey and cinnamon. I'm never going to meet your grandmother, am I? No. She passed away a long time ago. I think she would have liked you. She always had a good read on people. That and she could always spot a haunted house. Every time we would pass one, she would say some old Cuban lady bruja shit about el mal de ojo or spiritos malos. She sounds like she was amazing. The best. Arthur snapped back to reality, seeing the cracked screen of the cell phone he was still holding. He suddenly felt sick to his stomach, but didn't voice his discomfort. What am I supposed to do with this? Turn it on. He held still for a moment, before swiping his finger against the screen, hoping that nothing would happen. But he wouldn't be so lucky. The screen lit up, and unlocked to reveal his screensaver. A picture of his grandmother, holding him up in the air so that he could grab clothes off of a laundry line. It had been his screensaver ever since she passed. He glanced at the screen, the image surprisingly clear, and noted that there was an error indication on the top next to his notification banner. Written across the screen, in small, nearly opaque text, he saw the message, Failure to Authenticate. I, I can't open it. The face scanner must be broken or something. Or it doesn't recognize you anymore. 
The message felt ominous, and was maybe even a bit of an insult. He began turning the phone over in his hand, inspecting its various surfaces, when he heard a chime. He quickly turned the phone back around and saw on his screen a single text message. It was from Linda, and in all capital letters, Help me. He dropped the phone on the ground and turned his head towards the door. He could feel it just beyond the thin layer of plywood watching him. Was it amused? Pleased by his terror and misery? He couldn't be certain, but now he was flooded with a new emotion. Rage. Just what the fuck is this? Are you trying to torture me before you do whatever the fuck it is you're here to do? My purpose here is self-explanatory, Arthur. Did you see her text? You should really respond. No. Fuck you. I'm not playing this game with you. I refuse to take part in this. Linda is dead. Her psycho husband slit her throat and disappeared. She's gone. Chime. Another message. Arthur froze. He didn't dare to move. Didn't dare to look down at the phone that he knew was at his feet. She sounded rather desperate in her first message. Don't you think, Arthur? The entity beyond the door chided. It was taking pleasure in this, all right. But he knew that there was only one way out of this. To play this game until it was bored enough to leave. He reached down, gripped the phone in his hand, and turned it over. Brightly displayed on the screen was a new message. He's coming. Please. I'm scared. Could it really be Linda? Or was this thing just playing some cruel joke on him before it took him to whatever hell it crawled out of? He swiped his fingers across the screen a couple times, attempting somehow to unlock the screen manually. He couldn't respond to her message on his screensaver, couldn't call the police. His phone was as useful as a brick. I swear to God, if you somehow have her, if you're doing anything to her, I swear to Christ! Neither are present, unfortunately. Perhaps their invitations got lost in the mail. Or maybe they simply burned the invite. Really, though, Arthur, this is your party. It's your job to have fun, not to force your guests to provide all the entertainment. Fuck you! Ask yourself, Arthur, why am I here? If not to serve some greater purpose, then what? Have you ever seen a miracle? Water to wine, five loaves and two fish? No? Well, then maybe you should stop praying to entities you've never seen and focus on me instead. I'm very, very real. And I'm right here with you. All you have to do is let me in. And if I let you in, what will happen? The kid who told me about you, he told me what you did to his parents. Is that what you're going to do to, to Linda? To me? <laughs> Perhaps. But you'll have to open the door to find out. Arthur felt his blood boiling. How much more of this could he take? He walked back to his bed, sat down, and listened for the dripping of his sink. He stared absent-mindedly into the screen of his cell phone at the message displayed therein. For some reason, he couldn't help but remember the day his abuela died. She was 98 years old, a fantastic age for a woman who grew up in Havana, malnourished and pressed under the thumb of her militant government. She had grown up in a small neighborhood, where the houses sat on steep hills made mostly of concrete and granite. It was those streets, those houses with their unforgiving surfaces that raised her to be the strong woman he loved to this day. She had taught him everything about being a man, at least all the things his father never seemed willing to. Senora Rosi, the neighborhood called her. Everyone back home knew who she was and loved her. She would cook food for the homeless and leave plates for them outside of her home, same for the stray cats and dogs. 
She would go to neighbors' homes and cleanse them with her old bruja magic that she swore worked wonders. But as strong as she was, not even an all-powerful witch like her could withstand the trials of time. On her 76th birthday, she fell and broke her hips. By her 80th, she couldn't walk anymore. And by her 90th, her mind had started to go with the rest of her health. That is to say, out the window. It tore him apart to see her in such pain all the time, to watch her get confused about simple things, forgetting what channel her favorite novelas were on, losing track of her medication and if she had taken them, forgetting his name. It was hard. Probably the hardest thing he ever did, putting her in a home at 95. But he felt that with the level of support she needed, he just couldn't maintain his own life and take care of her. He still maintained daily visits with her until he was 27, and then the visits started to decrease in frequency. Once or twice a week, and then once or twice a month, to sometimes just a phone call. He hadn't thought about it for a long time now, but he felt a pang of guilt strike him in his chest. What he would give, he thought to himself, to hear her voice right now. Chime. Another message flashing across his screen, this time partially cut off because of its length. Arthur, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. It was never my intention to hurt you. I just needed you to know that I... The message cut off. Aren't you going to reply? Poked the voice again. This time, he sounded more... Together? Whole? It was an odd nuance that he was able to pick up, and the voice was now starting to sound more human. Familiar, even. I already told you that I can't... Why don't you just tell me what the hell all of this is about? Did you love her? What? The question caught him off guard. He had never considered it, but he supposed he did. They had planned for a future together, seen each other every week for several months, sometimes twice in one day. But was that love? He knew the sex was electric, the conversations equally as charged, but while he enjoyed her time, he never thought of Linda as his. He always suspected that one day or another, she would sort things out with her husband, or find a new, more interesting partner to occupy her time with. He supposed that he didn't love her. But then what was this pain in his chest? Have you ever heard of Dante's Inferno? It's the story of a man who journeys into hell to recover the soul of the woman he loves. She's been sent to hell for leading a life of sin, and he refuses to leave her to her fate. What does that have to do with anything? Well, the entire time he's walking through hell, taking in its immeasurable suffering, he has a guide. A man who walks with him and makes the nightmares make sense. He was the great poet Virgil the real-life Dante's idol. Think of yourself as Dante right now. You're wandering through hell, trying desperately to make sense of it all. And what? You're Virgil? No. I'm hell. Just waiting on the other side of this door. One choice away from having you. One choice away from you letting me in. And then, Dante... You can see what it was all for. So that's it. I'm being punished for what happened to Linda and her family? How was I supposed to know? She never told me, never told me she was still with her husband. All I know was that they had a terrible fight and she came to me for help. She came to you for comfort in the form of raunchy hotel sex. The only one who had any illusions about her being an innocent and delicate flower was you, lover boy. So what was I supposed to fucking do? 
Play 20 questions, interrogate her, force her to tell me that she was still fucking her husband and making her kids lunch bags before coming to visit? So, you did hate her children. No, I didn't. I mean, I never got to meet them. They weren't. No. You know what? Fuck this. Fuck you. I don't have to put up with this. You're not real. You're some figment of my imagination, something I ate that didn't agree with my stomach. You can't be real. This is all too fucking crazy. There was sudden silence. No sound anymore. Not even the dripping of the faucet. And it made his blood freeze in his veins. He glanced over towards the door, waited for it to burst open to reveal some horrible and hideous entity for the wood to splinter open and reveal the corpse of Linda's dead husband. Imagined what his body would look like at this point after months of decaying somewhere even the police could never find. His rotten eyes peering through the crack in the door, like the scene out of The Shining. But there was nothing. He stood up cautiously, walked over to the door and leaned his ear against it, trying to hear anything on the other side of it even if it was just breathing. What he heard instead confused him. Crying. The sound of what could only be a grown man crying. He could hear the man mumbling under his voice. The words completely unintelligible. Chime. He nearly jumped out of his own skin. The crying on the other side of the door ceased altogether and he backed away again, towards his bed. He leaned against the small iron railing and looked at his phone's dimly lit screen again, the battery now below 20%, the red battery symbol flashing ever so slightly. He glanced down at the new message once more, this one also cut off due to its length. He has my kids, Arthur. Please, you have to know what you meant to me, what all of it meant to me. Being with you was the last time I ever felt truly normal. You... He started to weep. He couldn't contain it anymore. The tears started to come. Good. You're almost ready to let me in, said the disembodied voice on the other side of the door now. Arthur didn't care anymore. He continued to weep. He cried over how hopeless it all felt, how meaningless his life had been up until this point, trying to find meaning in his job with Linda. He spent most of his early 20s taking care of his grandmother. He never had time to just be a kid. His mother wasn't able, and he was also the only breadwinner in his household. So while his friends went out and drank and partied, he stayed home or went to work. That changed when he met Linda. She was crying on a park bench. He walked through the park every day to feed the birds, but that day, he found her instead. They stared at each other at first, neither saying a word. Her face was covered in snot and tears, her makeup running for the hills. He didn't have a handkerchief to offer, so he took off his sweater and held it in the air with what Linda described as the kind of smile a guy gives you when he's trying to convince you he isn't a threat. It made her burst out laughing, and he just stood there, taking it in. Her laugh wasn't cute like they tell you it will be in movies. It was unguarded, authentic, the kind of laugh that would show your dentist if you had any cavities. He started to laugh too, and then they had just spoken for hours. They exchanged phone numbers, went their separate ways, and for three months he didn't hear from her. But on the seventh day of the third month, he received a desperate phone call. Linda had gotten into a physical argument with her husband. He had bruised her up pretty bad, and she was hardly able to speak over the phone without sobbing uncontrollably. He drove three hours out of his way to pick her up. He didn't even remember agreeing to do so, or hearing her ask him to, but nonetheless, they met up, and he took her to a hotel, 
where he made a hot bath for her, and they made love for the first time. So you did love her then? Wait, what? Said Arthur, his stream of consciousness suddenly getting interrupted by the visitor. You just said it. You made love to her. So you did have feelings for her, despite your best efforts. And before even the first time. Bit eager of you, isn't it? Just a tad desperate. You're in my head. Is that so surprising? Come on. Surely you've grasped it by now, Arthur. Get out of my fucking head! You're not real. None of this is real. Not the phone, not you, not Lynn. Chime. Arthur looked down again, his eyes wild and frenzied with rage and desperation now. There was a new message from Linda, yes, but at the top of the screen, he could see a new message, where once it said, failed to authenticate. Scanning, it said. And then suddenly, the screen opened up and he could see all of Linda's messages in front of him, could see the date and timestamp as well. The messages were from a year ago, the day that Mayor Osman was seen leaving town. 2.13 a.m. Help me. 2.23 a.m. He's coming, please. I'm scared. 2.26 a.m. Arthur, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. It was never my intention to hurt you. I just need you to know that I never intended to keep any of this from you. But we just keep seeing each other, and I didn't want to ruin it. Arthur felt his head start to spin. He started to feel dizzy and nauseous, his equilibrium suddenly off kilter. He felt unusually cold. Like he just came from the outside, the chill setting into his bones and rattling them in his skin. What is this? This is from the day that she... That he... That son of a bitch... It was you, wasn't it? You did this to her! It's you, Mayor Osmond, isn't it? No. I already told you, Arthur. I'm Hell. And you are Dante. You must pass through fire and give up all hope, ye who enter here. Suddenly, there was the sound of rushing water again. From under the door, liquid started to pool and rapidly crawl its way towards him. Arthur jumped onto his bed as the water continued to pour in endlessly. <sighs> no, you said you can't come in unless I let you in. I haven't done it yet. You're not allowed to come in. Arthur, you're not done reading yet. Arthur tried to steady his breathing. The water was continuing to rise, but the door stayed secured. He still had a chance to get out. He ran over to the windows, tugged at them to try and get them to open. But when he pulled the blinds open and looked outside, he couldn't understand what he was seeing. Everything was cast in a gray-blue light. The street lamps below his second-story bedroom outside turned off, the grass swaying oddly. Wait, no, not grass, kelp, or seaweed? And then, a river bass suddenly swam into his vision, floating through the air. No, not air. Water? I told you, you could choose the window or the front door. You still haven't read all of your messages, Arthur. Arthur turned on his heel toward the voice, and then back to the window. Panic was starting to set in again. Was he underwater? How was that possible? His whole house under water. He kept tugging at the window, trying to pry it open, but he couldn't get it free. He glanced at his nightstand and his alarm clock. He wrenched it out of the wall and swung it above his head like an impromptu flail. He swung it with all of his force into the window several times. The window never even so much as cracked. Just tell me what you want. Tell me what I have to do. Oh, I don't have an answer to that, Arthur. That's something you'll have to figure out. 
Are you going to open the window and jump? Or are you going to open the door and let me in? If I let you in, will you kill me? It's a possibility, Arthur. Arthur grabbed his head in his hands and let out a mournful scream. He looked over at the window and then back at the door. Finally, his eyes landed back on the cell phone. He ran over to it, the water in the room now at knee height. He swiped open the screen and continued reading. 2.30 a.m. He has my kids, Arthur. Please, you have to know what you meant to me. What all of it meant to me. Being with you was the last time I ever felt truly normal. You made me feel like I was human. Like I wasn't used up and broken. It's not your job to do that for anyone, but you did it for me. And I wish I had messaged you sooner, but I figured you hated me. I love you, Arthur. Please, I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. Arthur caught his breath. Not just because of the content of the messages, but because he realized now that he remembered reading this before. In fact, in his message thread, he could clearly see that he had read these messages nearly a year ago. He became more confused and suddenly had a question for the visitor. The water, now waist height, made it difficult to move, but he made his way to the door, wading through the murky liquid as it continued to fill up his living space. What happened to her? Tell me the truth. Did you have anything to do with this? No. I was completely innocent. I never could have known. The response suddenly lit a light bulb in Arthur's mind. He quickly turned back to the phone, reading the next message. 2.32 AM He's got me locked up in the guest bathroom. He tied my hands but didn't do a great job, so I managed to get out. Luckily, he forgot to take my phone from me. I don't know if you're angry with me and ignoring me or if you're just asleep, but I guess I deserve this. I lied to you. I kept my husband's identity a secret, but I want you to know that you were the singular greatest thing in my life. I love you, Arthur. Please, forgive me. Life is unfair. It takes... And it takes, and it takes. There's no rhyme or reason to the cruelty. We're all just flotsam and jetsam in the great sea that is the human experience. Just trying not to drown or crash and splinter into pieces. Sometimes the end is painless. Sometimes it's brutal and horrific. And none of us ever know which it'll be, the visitor said. He sounded resigned, tired, like he just finished a boxing match. He continued. It's so easy for us to point the blame at anyone else but ourselves. To see the cruelty and say, well, not my problem. Why should I care? I had no part in it. It's surely not my fault. Me. Completely without fault. Arthur started to speak, picking up where the visitor left off. I abandoned my grandmother. I abandoned Linda. I left them to die a cruel, lonely death. How am I supposed to live with that? You try. You do what you can every day, each day, until you can't anymore. And then you keep fighting anyway. I'm just so tired. I know, Arthur. I'm so sorry. What are you? I think you already know, Arthur. Come on, bud. One more message to read. Then, 
It's time to make a choice. Just remember, it's always harder climbing down. The room fell silent, the water still rising and now just above his chest. Arthur looked at the screen, tears still streaming out of his eyes, trying to see through the salty liquid at Linda's final message. 2.41 a.m. He came in and gave me something to make me sleep. I don't think I'll ever wake up again. I just want you to know, Arthur, I was so excited to give my whole future to you. I love you, and I'm so sorry. Please, when you wake up and see these messages, don't blame yourself. This isn't your fault. You are completely innocent. You never could have known. I love you. Goodbye, Arthur. The water finally crested over Arthur's head, and he was submerged beneath the briny substance. He felt his body slowly lift off the ground and he began to float, feeling his head just hit the ceiling before he bobbed uselessly in the water. He threw a glance toward the window, and then back at the door. Decision time. He swam toward the door, gripping his hands on the knob. The water was freezing and biting into his flesh. He could feel his eyes stinging with the cold as he tightened his fist around the knob. He pulled against the door, trying to get it open, but it wouldn't move. It was like it was frozen in place. It's always harder climbing down. Arthur placed his feet on either side of the door on the adjoining walls. He tightened his fist around the doorknob again and began to pull, throwing his legs and back into the equation. He strained so hard that he could feel the veins in his neck starting to pop with the force of his pulling. He could feel the air in his lungs starting to burn now, the phone slowly floating away from him, spinning slowly as if in space, showing him the picture of Signora Rossi, holding up a little boy who loved to pull down freshly washed laundry. He thought about the day she taught him how to tie a tie, thought about all the conversations he had with Linda all the way into the wee hours of the morning, thought about all the times he laughed so hard with her that he couldn't see straight. It was beautiful. His life had been beautiful. With the last of his strength, he pulled one more time, the air escaping his lungs, bubbling out of his mouth, letting the water in. As the door slowly started to peel open and he could see light pour through, and a voice calling him. Hey, asshole! Get the hell down from there! What the fuck do you think you're doing? You trying to die? Arthur snapped his head up suddenly. He looked around him, out to the trees that outlined the river in front of him, felt the freezing mist splash his face, looked down at the rushing waters, and a man standing on the bridge, flailing his arms. In his right hand, his cell phone, broken, with a huge crack in one portion of the screen. Hey, buddy, come on, man, don't do it, please. Uh, you got someone I can call? Come on, let's just, let's just have a chat. Arthur looked at the man, dumbly. He couldn't think of anything to say, so he just said, I, I think I want to come down. All right, all right, that's great. Just be careful, man. It's always harder coming down. I'll be down here. Take it slow and easy. Arthur did just that, slowly making his way down the beams and supports before reaching the ground. The man Arthur could now see was a man in his late 50s. Arthur looked out at the river and then back down at his phone. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a paperclip, removing the memory stick. What, uh, what are you doing there, bud? Arthur didn't answer, but instead chucked the phone into the river, hearing it crack against the rocks before splashing 
into the water, never to be seen again. What I came here to do, he answered quietly. Oh, uh, okay then. That's all you came here to do. Arthur shook his head. No, that wasn't all I came out here to do. Ah, well, I'm glad I came then. Let me take you back home. You live in the town just a ways off? Yeah. Yeah, I do. All right, well, I only got two rules about riding with me. No guns and no rolling down the window. <laughs> got it. They walked over to the man's truck, which was parked in the nearby snowbank, the same place that Linda's body was found. He stood still outside the passenger side door, looking into the forest beyond, listening to the river. He pulled the door open and then sat down in the passenger seat before asking, Hey, do you have a phone? Mind if I make a call real quick? He asked the stranger. Uh, sure. Here, go for it. Arthur grabbed the man's flip phone, typed in a nine-digit number, and waited before he heard someone answer. Uh, hey. Yeah. Yeah, it's me. I'm sorry I haven't called in a while. I've just been really busy. No. No, I'm not. I'm really not okay. I hope you enjoyed The Visitor, as written and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number seven, Luis Bermudez. Thank you for listening and joining us tonight for this episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Don't forget, all of tonight's performances were featured in the fourth and final round of our ongoing Evil Idol 2019 Horror Voice Acting Competition, hosted on our official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel. If you enjoyed the performances tonight, visit our YouTube channel and check out the more than seven dozen fantastic entries in the competition. And don't forget to participate by voting in the fourth round while you still can. Again, you can find the CTFDN and the Evil Idol competition on YouTube. Just search Chilling Tales for Dark Knights YouTube on any search engine, or visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Evil Idol link on the navigation bar to see your current roster, contestant profiles, and links to all of the performances thus far. We and the candidates appreciate your support. Also, as a reminder, take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave us a five-star review and a kind word and to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Otis Gyrie, and it's been a pleasure as always. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> sweet dreams, listeners, sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com 
to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.